welcome to Crimson Grey. So I received the request to do something romantic for our Valentine's Day, and best case scenario, this should end the day after, I think, and then we can try and knock out the various endings. So I will point out something here. I'm going to have the adult content turned on because I believe there's a scene that's just completely taken out, but the game pretends like you actually know what's happening for that scene. Depending on what exactly is there, I'll try to mosaic stuff out, but it's entirely possible that adult content could refer to gore. So, we'll see what exactly happens. As for the premise of the game, I'm going to keep you guys guessing on this one, just because this is unlike anything else on the channel. For one, it's romantic. So, let's just jump in and hope for the best. So I got definitely romance unlocked already just for playing the game, I guess. John had always thought of himself as a stable person. Stability worked out well when he was just trying not to let the little things get him down. It wasn't so great when everything was crumbling around him. When the entire world started seeming gray and flat, then he began wondering if all that stability would kill him, and if he would care when it did. There weren't any highs or lows anymore. Whatever happened to him, John didn't feel happy or sad. He just... Hey, hey, what are you just doing, spacing out, man? You're a real headcase these days, John. You going to float away on us? Sorry, just distracted. A moment later, he started drifting away again. Even his friend's voices were nothing but buzzing in his ears, meaningless sounds echoing in his hollow shell. They weren't even really his friends. They were friends with the happy-go-lucky person he'd been at the beginning of high school. These days, they joked about him being no fun, but it was more than a joke. They'd get tired of him, find someone else, and then he'd be alone. He wasn't sure whether or not that would be worse. Whoa, is that creepy chick staring at us? I think she is. Who is that, anyway? Lizzie Doss, I think. And are you, right? John, doesn't she have math with you or something? It took John a second to even register the question. They were staring at some girl who was staring back at them. Damn, she is really staring. Is she staring at us, or John? I think it's him. Think she's a stalker? Yeah, those are some crazy eyes. Better watch out, John. You're a real sad sack these days, but you can do better than her. Shut up. The words were past his lips before he could stop them. Why did he have to open his mouth now, of all times? But he couldn't let them keep talking about her like that. People called him creepy or crazy all the time, and he hated it. But after those two words, he just stood there like an idiot. Even when something mattered to him, he couldn't pull himself together. What's wrong with you, man? Don't say things like that about people you don't know. She's just hanging out up here like we are. Uh, no, she's given us some serious crazy eyes. Just leave her alone, okay? She hasn't done anything to you. Sheesh, okay, man. I think she's going to fall in love with you as her handsome protector or something? That'd just be like John. Uh, talk to the crazy girl, be our guest. We're heading back to class. Don't wait up, man. The way her eyes moved. John thought that she was focused on him so intensely that she might not have even heard what the other said. Did he even bother her? He wished he could be like that, instead of the smallest thing sending him into a crashing state of worthlessness. But maybe she was like him, just capable of hiding it. John cleared his throat and walked up to check on her. Hey, sorry about them. They can be assholes sometimes. Well, I guess I don't have a lot to say. Sorry if we bothered you. John slunk away and cursed his own idiocy. She had been fine without him. He just made everything worse. There had been something hard in her eyes. A strength he didn't have. He had probably been projecting all his weakness onto her in the first place. She wasn't like him. Wasn't broken. She could shrug off the things his friends had said and get on with their life. At least, that meant she could shrug off his annoyance, too. She'd probably just forget all about him. Thank you. You're so kind. Such a kind person. The kindest person. The only person. I found you. I finally found you. I found you. I found you. I found you. I found you. 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 You.
The teacher's voice is incomprehensible, but John knew he must be picking it up on some level. He wasn't sure how, but even though he stumbled through every day, he was doing okay in school. He could seem normal whenever he wanted to. It just didn't feel worth it. That was almost the worst part. He seemed normal even though nothing was normal anymore. It wouldn't ever be normal again. What did Miss M Mrs. Smythe say? High-functioning depression? Such an awful empty phrase. Ellie's class was over now. He could go home, sleepwalk through his homework, and then fall unconscious. At least for a few hours, he could... Then he became aware of her. She was watching him. Maybe she wanted to thank him. No, he was being stupid. He'd done nothing worth thanking. More likely, she wanted something from him. Or, most likely of all, maybe she didn't care about him, and he was imagining the whole thing. She was still staring, though. Let's go talk to her. What's the worst that could happen? Can I help you? If this is about before, I'm sorry. I just wanted to help. She looked really uncomfortable. Of course, she probably hated him as much as everyone else. Trying to shame, John decided to cut his losses. Well, sorry to bother you. I'll be going. He needed to get to his appointment anyway. He didn't want Mrs. Smythe getting mad at him again. Mrs. Smythe was one of the only people John could focus on. He wasn't sure how much good she actually did him aside from prescribing medicine, but at least she tried to help. John, you're looking you're not looking so bad today. Did something good happen? Boy your age ought to be more interested in girls. Are you dating someone? No, I can't focus on people. Maybe I could prescribe you something for that. We don't have any on hand now, but I could get it quickly. That's an advantage of having Koi Tech in town. I don't want to take this medicine anymore. I don't think it's working. The Paxidine? But that's the first one you've really responded to. I feel worse. Everything is so gray. Voices just echo. Can't I go back to a generic medicine? John, you need to understand that you are deeply clinically depressed. It's my professional opinion that you should you should under no conditions go off your medic medication. When you're getting used to a medication, there can be some initial side effects. Sometimes things have to get worse before they get better, okay? Okay. All he heard was that he was too broken for any drug to fix. He was so worthless, even the newest drugs from Koitek didn't do anything. I'll renew your Pax-9 prescription, and see about getting you a complimentary drug. We'll figure this out yet, John. Now, why don't you lie down over there and we can begin our session? Good. Get comfortable. Did anything special happen during the day today? No, it was a normal day. The therapy session quickly fell away into a meaningless buzz. For a short time, at least, he didn't feel the emptiness. Finally, or too soon, it was over. Mrs. Smythe told him he was doing well and sent him on his way. John slumped back home. The house was empty like it always was. Ever since his mother left, his father spent all his time working. He did his homework, he ate, he cleaned the dishes, he sat down in front of the TV and stared at it without turning it on. Somehow, he dragged himself into bed and fell asleep. The routine used to be comforting, but now it was starting to erode his sanity. His mind had to crack eventually. Maybe it was already happening. For a second, he thought he saw a girl out the window. But no, there was nothing. Of course there wasn't. He really was losing it. Another day. He had to face it somehow. It seemed impossible until the moment he finally stumbled into class. School was the usual mindless buzz. There was a job fair announced in third period as if that meant anything at all. Almost everyone in their school would either go to work for Koitek, move away, or stay in town and become unemployed. John wondered which of those would happen to him, but from a distance, as if he was thinking about some person he barely knew. His grades were good enough to get into Koitek, but the process was so competitive. No, he didn't have enough energy for that. He couldn't imagine moving away, looking for a job in a strange city. Most mornings, the most he could imagine was surviving the day. But his father wouldn't support him, and his mother didn't want him. Once he graduated, there'd be no way he could stay with either of them. What would happen to him, then? Would he just... become homeless? Sit there on the street, begging for change until one night he froze to death. 
Maybe that was all he deserved. John, are you alright? Sorry, sir. I'm paying attention, honestly. I didn't ask that. I asked if you were alright. I'm fine. Well, be sure to talk to the counselor if you're feeling bad, alright? We're lucky to have someone like Mrs. Smythe with us. He had to keep it together. He remembered the lessons, but if people were starting to think something was wrong, his control was slipping. He had enough time to visit his locker in between periods. There was more Paxidine there. He still had an extra dose left for the day. His locker was on the bottom row, so he always had to bend down and... There was a piece of paper sitting in the middle of his locker. Cheer up! That was all it said. Nothing on the backside, no other clues. Probably a girl's handwriting. Who left it? Hey, did you see anyone mess messing with my locker? Huh? Something got stolen? There's way too many guys around here for me to notice. Might have been a girl leaving a note. Like a love note? Keep dreaming, John. You think any girl's going to love your sorry ass? No. Of course no one could love him. So you didn't see anyone? Okay, thanks. Hey, John. You gonna tell me she's a Canadian? I'm heading back to class. See you later. And she's really hot, right? Your imaginary girlfriend sounds amazing! John knew he should probably just take some more Paxidine and head back to class, yet... He was still holding onto the paper. He wasn't sure why. It really could be a prank. One of the guys trying to trick him. If so, it would probably be followed by another fake note. Asking him to come out under the stupid confession tree. Where they'd wait and then laugh at him. But for just a moment, he saw the girl watching him. Could it have been her? By the time he got to class, John had a new theory. She felt sorry for him. He must have looked pretty pathetic, and she recognized his misguided good intentions enough to feel pity. The rest of the day passed in more of a blur than usual. He might be delusional, but part of John still hoped it wasn't a prank. He headed to his locker, not daring to imagine anything. And there was another paper there waiting for him. They shouldn't say those things about you. Oh, shit. It didn't even look like the same person's handwriting. The first had been beautiful calligraphy. This one was a hurried scrawl. If it was all a prank, he no longer had any idea where they were going with this. He'd already been beating himself up over saying the wrong thing, so this was too much for John. He headed straight home to get some sleep before he cracked completely. The next day, John went as early as possible and approached his locker anxiously. He wasn't sure what he wanted to find. There was no note this time, but there was a chocolate heart wrapped in foil, set in the exact center of the bottom of his locker. John stared at it for a while, then slipped it into his pocket and headed to class, even though he knew he would be far too early. There was no way he could eat it. If it really was a prank, they might have slipped a laxative or something inside of it. That was the kind of thing his friends thought was funny. But if it was that girl... It didn't matter now. What mattered was that someone clearly knew his locker combination could get in whenever they wanted. That could be a real problem. He knew he should come up with a solution before tomorrow, but what? Hmm. Let's do the worst thing possible. We'll leave a note. John cut a small sheet of paper from one of his notebooks, wrote thanks on the inside, and set it in his locker. If it was a prank, that ought to throw the pranksters off. And if it was someone who meant well, hopefully they'd just take it as normal gratitude. He headed home, and once his homework was done, fell quickly asleep. Next morning, he thought he spotted someone outside his window, but there was no one there. When he opened his locker the next day, the note was gone. Making an effort to set the mystery of the locker aside, John went with his friends to the rooftop for lunch. They spread out on one side, enjoying the sight of the trees below. Midway through the meaningless conversation, John noticed that Lizzie was watching him from the far side of the roof. His gaze was even more intense than her gaze was even more intense than before, so he uncomfortably tried to ignore her and focus on the conversation. Looks like the confession tree is in full bloom, huh? Do you really believe those stories? True love and all that? It works, man. I've got a buddy who just graduated. He swears he got so much pussy confessing under it. Well, if he kept doing it, then it's not true love, is it? 
Come on, people have been confessing there for years. You seriously think everyone would confess under the tree if it did nothing? Eh, man, I think it's a tree of lust. Doesn't guarantee true love, just getting laid. If that was true, way more guys would be into it. But it's mostly girls from what I've seen. What do you think, John? I don't know. Don't be that way. You dream of a girl, a girl confessing to you under that tree, don't you? Yeah, like that crazy stalker chick. It'd make your heart go all flutter if she confessed, wouldn't it? That tree is magic, man. I'm telling you, even a sad sack like you could get lucky if you confess there. Don't be stupid, it's just a tree. Whoa, someone has their pennies in a twist. I'm telling you, everyone goes there to... Only because people like you keep telling these stories. There's nothing magic about the tree. People just believe it's special because everyone else says it is. Girls think the tree is romantic, so of course they're more likely to agree there. And guys would have to turn someone down in front of an audience. That's all it is. Shit, man. What is wrong with you today? With an attitude like that, you're never going to get a girl. You insulted the tree. It'll cock block you now. Ha ha ha. That day, John couldn't get to his therapy appointment fast enough. Mrs. Smythe smiled at him when he came in, but he but immediately saw he was unhappy. Are you okay, John? Perhaps you should be in a stronger formulation. No. Well, our session should make you feel better. Lie down and get comfortable. Mrs. Smythe, does Paxidine have any visual side effects? I should hope not. Koitek has the highest standards for every drug it puts out, and Paxidine is nearing its final clinical trials. Are you having any vision problems? John lay back and stared out the window. Was he really seen differently, or was it all in his head? He stared a long time before he opened his mouth and just started talking. Everything just feels so... gray. So you are having vision problems. Not literally gray, it's just... The sky today. I remember when I was younger, I always thought clouds were beautiful. Now it's like there's nothing there. Nothing that matters. I look up, and I just don't care. That sounds more likely to be a mental issue, then. Why don't you get more relaxed and talk about it? Taking a deep breath, John did his best. As usual, after talking with Mrs. Smythe for, too, for long enough, he felt not better, necessarily, but at least not miserable. Their session went by in a flash, then he had to head home. He shuffled through his routine easily enough, slept fitfully, and then returned to school barely more rested. But when he arrived, he found a huge crowd standing and staring. What's going on? You know that tree students like to confess under? The words made John shiver, even though he wasn't entirely sure why. He shifted to look through the crowd, and then he saw it. Parts of the tree were still burning, but the rest was charred ashes coated the ground near it. His throat was dry, as if all the ashes were filling it. What happened? The cops are coming to check it out, but the shop teacher said it looked like arson. Someone covered the tree in gasoline and burned it down. See, this is why we need cameras. I've been telling the principal for years, but does he listen to me? No. No one thinks. The word slid off his mind and John turned away without even saying goodbye. Not entirely sure what he was doing, he stumbled straight to his locker. When he opened his locker, he discovered a folded note set in the exact center like always. He stared at it for a long moment before unfolding it with trembling hands. I didn't like that tree either. He stared at the words as if they were a foreign language, which he could avoid understanding the conclusion. I didn't like that tree either. It was her. It had to be. None of his friends would be that insane. And what would be the point of a prank like that? But what was the point for her? What did she think she'd accomplished? Should he tell someone? But this wasn't exactly evidence, and did he really want her to get in that much trouble? John decided he was being stupid, like usual. He just needed to talk to her and find out exactly what was going on. There would an end to this. That day, whenever he was in the hallways, he could feel her eyes on him. With every passing moment, he became more sure that she had burned the tree down. He wondered if a normal person would be afraid now. But for him, it barely penetrated his numbness. He just wanted to find out what was wrong and put an end to it. It took until after school for him to find his chance. When the teacher handed out assignments, he volunteered to clean the roof. 
John stepped onto the roof and headed to the far side. After a few seconds, he heard the door open again. He ignored it and instead climbed up to the tank. The upper area was meant to be blocked off. The janitors had stopped putting up the ladder years ago. He turned into a shock. She was already coming up the ladder behind him. Reaching the top, she held her hands close to her chest and shuffled her feet demurely. But there was a spark in her eyes. Hello, Lizzie. Are you never going to greet me? Hello. I said it. I said it. Why are you following me? Because I... I l Could this girl really have burned down the tree? Didn't seem like she had it in her. Were you the one leaving me notes in my locker? Yes. How did you know my combination? I, I watched you. You left me a note. It was almost too much. I took it home and I'll keep it forever and ever and ever. John realized that he was in way over his head, yet his mouth was still moving, asking the inevitable question. Why did you burn it down? Because it was a stupid tree. You're so smart you said it just right. It was awful and stupid and I hated and hated and hated and hated and hated and hated and hated. It's all because of you, John. I could never do what needed to be done before. Now I can. She wasn't stable. She wasn't even close. What had he gotten himself into? I finally found you. You're the only one for me. Part of him knew that he should do something. Run away. Call for help. Yet... Why? Huh? Why do you care about me? How can you ask that? You're, you're the best person. The only person. Bullshit. I'm just another high school boy. No, not even that. I'm worthless. No, 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 no. Don't say that. It's not true. It's not. I'm broken. My brain doesn't work right, and even the strongest drugs don't make a difference. No, that's not true. John is perfect. Perfect. How can you say these things? The way her words flow together... Addressing him directly one moment and in third person the next. Bothered him almost as much as the look in her eyes. Whatever it is she was, it went deep. You're not well, Lizzie. You need help. Y you said my name. But I can't help you. I'm not worth anything to anyone. Just forget about me and find someone else to care about. No, no, I could never. You're the only person who matters. But why? You don't even know me. You don't care about me. I'm just... just part of your problem. No. It would be better if I was gone. Maybe you'd get better then. That's not true. It's not. I love you, John. I've always loved you. I've watched you. Always. You're so good and kind and perfect, and even to a girl like me. He could barely even listen to her words. John found himself wandering closer and closer to the side of the building, and she followed him automatically. You're so sad, but you're still kind. I don't know how. You should be broken, like me, but you... I can't help you. If you want to help yourself, you need to forget about me and get real help. No. No, don't say that. You're, you're confused. Yes, confused. Poor John is so depressed he's not thinking straight. He doesn't understand how much I love him. He needs my help. The world froze for a moment as the knife glinted and all he could do was stare at its edge. You just need someone to take care of you. I'll stop everyone who says unkind things about you. No. No, I should just take you home and keep you there. Safe. Yes. You just need some help. Where the hell had she gotten that knife? Would she actually use it on him? A second later, John realized that was a foolish thought. The scroll had burned down a tree because he said it was stupid. He had no idea if there were any limits on what she might do. lying in his bed, wishing he'd never been born, wishing he had a way to end it all. You can't threaten me. John, get away from the edge. It's not safe. He took several steps to the very edge before she could stop him and turned around to face her. The back end of his shoes hung off the edge of the building, nothing between him and a fatal fall. My life matters so much to you. Stop toying around with me. No, no, you don't understand. What do you even want? To stab me until I'm yours forever? Is that it? Never. 
John is so good and kind, I would never need to stab him. Please come away. I'll take good care of you. You can't. Maybe you have good intentions, but you need help. And unless you get it, you can only hurt me. I will, I will. Whatever you want. I promise. Just don't hurt yourself. It was a lie, of course. She was just saying whatever it took to get him to step away from the edge. It was exactly how he imagined it would go. He'd stand at the edge, and everyone would say all kinds of lies about how much he mattered to them, because they'd care for the first time. Not about him, but about the idea of him. But, the look in her eyes, that couldn't be faked. It might be a twisted love, but she loved him utterly. I... She needed help, too. Maybe he could be the one to help her, assuming she didn't stab him. But what the hell was he living for, anyway? Lizzie, would you make a promise with me? A promise? I'll step away. I'll talk to you. Or let you leave notes in my locker, or whatever it is you want. But you have to listen to me and get some help. Can you do that? You promise? You promise you won't leave me if I say yes? I won't leave you, Lizzie. Forever? The answer stuck in his throat and he hesitated, wondering if he wasn't making a mistake and saying too much. But in the end, he swallowed and nodded. Forever. Now, set down the knife and not whoops. As he started to step away, John lost his balance and fell backward. Suddenly he was in free fall, nothing between him and gold pavement. At that moment Lizzie lunged forward, insanely fast, and grabbed his wrist. Impossibly she held him up. Her body was thin, yet somehow she had stopped his fall and held him up with one hand. Her eyes held a mixture of unstable fear and twisted desire. In that moment, he knew with absolute certainty that if he had fallen, she would have thrown herself off after him. You can't die, John. You're the only one. The only one. With that same incredible strength, she pulled him back up to the rooftop. Fortunately, she had left the knife behind when she lunged to catch him, but he was still anxious being so close to her. John, John almost died. John, I love you. I won't let anything bad happen to you. It was clear she was completely unstable, but was she actually dangerous? She seemed to care about him more than anything. Or was he just so pathetic that he latched onto anyone who showed him the slightest sign of affection? Worthless. You'll keep your promise, right? Of course, of course. Then tomorrow, we'll go talk to someone. See if we can't get you some medication. Is that okay? If that's what John wants, then of course it's okay. Good. Then perhaps... But I want more than that. I love you, John. I've told you over and over. Don't you love me, too? At least she was asking without the knife in her hand. But... Was there a good answer to that question? No, he had to think about it logically. She wanted him to answer yes, but that just might make her worse. The risk of saying no can be ignored either, though. So, you have to remember we're going for true love for Valentine's Day, so of course, Lizzie, we love you. Lizzie, I don't know you very well yet, but despite all this, I think you're a good person. No, no, I'm awful. John is just being kind and not answering the question. I want to get you to know you better, Lizzie. Maybe then I could love you. He said it, he said it. John desperately hoped that was a mistake. He hoped this all was a mistake. But he hadn't been stabbed yet, and after how today had gone, that was good enough for him. Then, I'll see you later, okay? I'll be watching you, but yes, later. You're not going to do anything crazy. No! John loves me. That's all that matters. We both need to get to class, but we'll talk tomorrow, okay? Okay. The rest of the day was even more of a blur than usual. Everyone's voice is not even echoing in his head. John could hardly believe what he had just done. It all seemed like a dream now. Had Lizzie really pulled a knife on him? Had he really threatened to jump off the school building? It made him wonder if he wasn't the insane one. But no, it had really happened. For better or for worse, he was stuck in the situation. Only when he was headed to bed did John realize that he felt strangely alive. Even better than after his therapy sessions. Maybe it was the brush with death. Maybe it was just having something to think about other than his pathetic existence, but he felt 
Almost good. Maybe that meant he was crazy too. But right now, he was just glad to sleep soundly. In the morning, it all seemed even more unbelievable. John sleepwalked through his routine, half certain that he would find out it had all been a dream. When he arrived at school, he found Lizzie waiting for him by the school entrance. She looked like she could have been waiting there the entire night. When she saw him, though, her face lit up. John, you're finally here! I've been waiting so long! Uh, good morning. Yes, it's a wonderful morning. I spent so long too nervous to talk to you. I'm afraid that you would hate me. We had such a nice talk. Now I'm barely nervous at all. But my heart it still goes crazy every time you get near, John. Isn't it horrible that we have to be in different classes? Lovers shouldn't be separated like this. Um, will you eat lunch with me today? Please, won't you? She could sound so adorable. Normally he'd be happy to have a girl like her asking to eat lunch together, but... Sure, on the roof again? No, there might be unkind people there and you might feel sad again. No, I have the perfect place. Where is it? That's a secret. I'll show you at lunchtime. He wasn't sure how to feel about that. For once, John had something to look forward to. Or dread. He wasn't sure. The minutes seemed to crawl by until it was finally lunchtime. When he went looking for Lizzie, he discovered that she was waiting behind him, completely silent, watching him. Hi, Lizzie. Let's go, let's go. We don't need to go to the cafeteria. This way. She practically dragged him away from the school and onto one of the paths in the nearby forest. Soon they got far enough that they didn't hear they couldn't hear any sounds from the school. Here is perfect, just perfect. Lizzie faced away from him, giving a soft laugh. Then suddenly she whirled about, thrusting something toward him. A lunchbox. I worked really hard on this. You have to eat it, you have to. Okay, thanks, Lizzie. She gave a little squeal and promptly sat down on a small rock. Seemed she had a second lunchbox of her own, but she kept it on her lap until he opened his. John was braced for a horror show, but to his surprise, it was just normal food. It actually looked pretty good. He took a bite, and it tasted good, too. John realized that Lizzie was staring at him intensely, as if her life was on the line, so he smiled at her. It's really good. I worked so hard on it. So, uh, do you want to just eat together, or... This is a date, isn't it? We should get to know each other more. I want to know everything about you. Well, I'm nothing special. That's not true. Let me see. What to say? Despite himself, John found it easy to talk to her. He was sure he sounded like an idiot, rambling about stupid mundane topics, as she listened every word with rapt attention. It was bizarre to have someone actually care about his life. His father never had time. His friends were busy with their own things. Mrs. Smythe was just listening professionally. But Lizzie really cared. He knew that she wasn't well, that her obsession was probably a sickness. Yet, a pathetic part of him didn't care. He was just happy to have someone paying attention to him. Only after talking for a long time did he realize that he was talking about himself like a self-centered jerk. She didn't seem to mind, but he still felt guilty. Sorry, I've been talking a lot. I can do that sometimes. Don't apologize. I like listening to you talk. It's been pretty boring, though. I mean, you already know a lot about me. I want to know everything about you. I've been watching you a long time. I know all the facts, but I still don't know everything. I can't see inside your head. That's where the most important parts of John are, but I can't see them. I wish... I wish there was a way to crack your head open. See all the thoughts inside. John swallowed uncomfortably. You can always just ask me what I'm thinking, okay? Okay, you're so nice, John. So, Lizzie, tell me about yourself. There's nothing to tell. I'm not important. I just want to listen to you more. Yes, but I want... If I want to know more about you, don't you want to tell me? John is so kind. I don't deserve him. So, what about your parents? I live alone now. Neither of my parents wanted me anyway. I'm, I'm sure that's not true. They probably ju- You don't have to make me feel better. I don't mind. You don't mind that your parents- My father never loved me anyway, and my mother is dead now. Um, my parents-
parents separated too. They never made it formal, but yeah, they're separated. Mom doesn't like to visit, and Dad is always at work, so it's not like he's really there. You mean they just leave you alone? How horrible! How dare they just leave you like that? Uh, clubs. Are you in any after-school clubs? When he was the point of the conversation away from troubling topics, John actually found himself enjoying their talk. Or maybe he's just happy to have someone to be talking to someone and actually managing to pay attention to the conversation. He finished every bite of the lunch without thinking about it. Given the way she stared at the last crumbs while he finished them, that was probably a good thing. Too late it occurred to him that she might tamper with the lunch. Yet, as she stared at him, so pleased that he enjoyed it, John couldn't believe that she would do anything bad to him. As soon as he had that thought, he remembered the tree and shivered involuntarily. After school, John had barely gotten out the door when he spotted Lizzie following him. It seemed as though she was stalking him at first, but when he made eye contact, she gave him a sweet smile and skipped forward. John, let's walk home together. Do we live in the same direction? No, but don't worry, I'll walk back to my house later. Which meant she did know where he lived. He really needed to be more cautious. Maybe we could do something else. You remember our promise? Yes. Getting medicine and therapy has really helped me out. I hope it'll help you too. Now, I think the easiest thing to do would be to take you to Mrs. Smith. She could... No. No, I hate her. She's awful and she wants to take you away from me. Wait a second now. That's not true. She just wants to help. She... John is too nice. He can't see what kind of person she is. I have to protect him. Whoa, whoa, Lizzie, wait. Calm down. If you don't want to talk to Mrs. Smythe, we can do something else, alright? Okay. So, probably best not to choose a woman. There had to be male koi -tech pharmacists in town. Maybe one of them could prescribe something. But he wasn't sure how that worked. He'd been counting on Mrs. Smy Smythe to guide the process. But now he'd have to figure it out himself. Lizzie, I need to do a little research first. Is that okay? Okay, I'll follow you. Maybe it would be easier if I did it myself. No, no, I don't like that idea. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? You can bring another lunch. Okay, see you tomorrow, John. He hoped that medication would help stabilize her. After all, she'd be cute if... Why exactly was he doing this? He had told himself it was to help her and make sure no one got hurt. But now he's hoping she could become normal and stay with him. Pathetic. He couldn't get a girlfriend normally, and so he had to take advantage of some poor girl's obsession. For now, it didn't matter. She really did need help, and he might be able to get it to her. It was just a question of how. The best way was probably to ask for advice, either from Mrs. Smythe or a pharmacist. He could try to research some himself, though he doubted he'd be any good at it. And he supposed it wouldn't hurt to ask her if she was taking anything else or had allergies or something. Damn it, he should have done that earlier. Now it was too late to... Sean realized that she was still following him. He shouldn't have been surprised. Okay, so asking her was still an option. But he only had so much time before he had to go home and do his schoolwork. So he needed to choose carefully. Let's talk to Lizzie. John walked along the street until he was sure that Lizzie was thinking after him, then turned and waved to her. She waved back. Hi, John. Did you change your mind? Can we go home together? I knew you... No, I just wanted to check with you. Are you taking any medication right now? Have you had any bad reactions in the past? No, I've never taken anything. My mother always took too many drugs. It scared me when I was little. I see. Are you sure you're really alright taking medication now, then? Ah, uh, John is so considerate. Don't worry, I'll be fine. I see you take your medicine every day to try to get better. I want to be like you. Okay, good. I think. I hope it'll help. I'll take anything you give me, John. Stepping out onto the street, John glanced at his watch and decided he had some more time to, do reser to research his options. Mm, that was no fun. Let's go in the library. Stopping by the library, John did his best to research possible medications among the books, even asking the librarians for help. It felt really ineffectual. He wished there was a better way to get information, but there wasn't a lot of options. One of his classes, they claimed that computers would eventually make things easier, but their school couldn't afford any. 
One of the few things you could do was skim through various books about mental illness for references to tattooed symptoms like Lizzie's. Her case sounded much worse than anything he'd read about. All the articles suggest that most mentally ill people were not violent, but he knew that wasn't true of Lizzie. Though there wasn't a lot of current information about Koitek, he did find some. There were crackpots who felt their medicine was ineffective. Even Paxstein had critics who felt it was being rushed to market. Sean forced himself to stop really reading about that, since it just made him feel worse. Instead, he focused on selecting potential drugs for Lizzie. Two showed up as potential candidates, Yandikel and Nilazine. According to the studies, Nilazine calmed people down but tended to flatten emotions, which a lot of people patients hated. By contrast, Yandikel had better reviews, other than nausea as a side effect, seemed to do a good job of calming violent people. Whether either of the drugs would be right for Lizzie, that was an entirely different question. It was getting late, and John realized he needed to get home quickly if he wanted to have time for his homework. On his way back, he was sure that Lizzie was following him, but couldn't get a clear look at her. At least it was only one more day until the weekend.